Yeah, if, can people hear me okay? If you can't, you can move up. There's lots of chairs up here. Okay, but before I get into uh, the body of what I'm going to say tonight, I'd just like to make a couple of preliminary remarks about, partly about New American Movement, partly about what I want to do here tonight. Um, New American Movement is, is a socialist organization, national in scope. We have about 40 chapters, about 600 members across the country. Uh, the, the leadership of New America Movement is elected. There are 13 people. Uh, I'm not one of those. I, I think that should be clear. I'm, I'm on the national staff. I was hired by the national leadership. And one of the things about NAM that I think is important to understand from the outset is that we're not the sort of organization that has a line on every single issue. And the reason for that is that one of the very principles of New American Movement is that we are developing a clear politics through practice in, in local struggles you know, throughout the country. So for that reason, it makes it very difficult for me to speak for NAM on everything. And I'm going to cover a broad range of topics. And so a lot of the things that I say really reflect my own politics and do reflect the politics of a lot of people in NAM. But you know, I, I just have to make that one disclaimer that everybody in NAM isn't going to agree with everything I say tonight. And that's the kind of organization we are. Um, the second thing I want to say is that I don't see my function here tonight as selling socialism. Uh, what I'm doing is to assume that and to explain some of my strategic perspectives about its application to the United States. The, getting into my talk now, uh, what I'm going to do is talk for about an hour and then open it up for questions. And um, <clears throat> the major thought that I want to develop is that socialist revolution in my view, and I think in Nam's view as well, is not an event. Um, I think it's become very common in New Left jargon to say that after the revolution, this or that will happen. But I believe that this is basically an incorrect and backward point of view. And that unfortunately, I think that this view gains a lot of momentum whenever capitalist contradictions heighten as they are today and a major crisis ensues. And as the crisis unfolds at the present time, with rapidly rising unemployment and the continuing inflation, some people are tempted to say that this is it, that this is the crisis, the one that's going to bring on the revolution, and when working people are going to revolt and overthrow the system. Others might caution uh, that this could result in fascism, which causes them to go scurrying about seeking out united fronts with, with a lot of liberals um, to try to protect constitutional rights and to gain state-sanctioned concessions from the capitalist system, while simultaneously plotting in clandestine organizations how their, their particular correct line will eventually lead the masses to revolt. It may be that the current crisis will cause considerable disruption, and it is possible that there may even be revolts or possibly even rebellion. But my position that I'm going to develop tonight is basically twofold. One is that revolution is a process. And it's a long process. It's a process of social change that involves primarily cultural and ideological reorientation. And at some point, it involves a seizure of the means of production and the smashing of the bourgeois state by the working class. That latter thing is an event. But the revolution itself is something that continues after that event and must precede it. Secondly, even if that event, even that particular event of the seizure of state power, in my view, is unlikely to come about unless it is preceded by well-organized mass movements which go far beyond normal class struggle and which through struggle achieves a high degree of class unity. Such unity, it seems to me, will require very significant ideological and cultural change. Okay, those are the major points that I want to develop tonight. And to develop them, I'm going to be breaking my presentation down essentially into four areas. First of all, I'm going to talk about the nature of capitalist crisis and say something about the crisis today, uh, providing some Marxist perspective to that crisis. Secondly, I'm going to address myself to the question of will capitalism fall of its own accord? And if not, what is it that holds capitalism together and allows it to weather crises. And then thirdly, 
I'm going to talk about some of the implications I see for the answer to that question for revolutionary socialist activity. And then finally, I'm going to talk a little more specifically about New American Movement. Okay, so let me begin then with some general views on the nature of capitalist crisis. I'm going to talk about this in two ways. And for those of you who have been through capital and so forth, which I understand some of you have, I hope I'm not uh, talking down to you. I don't mean to be, but I think we have a somewhat diverse audience. So I'm going to give sort of a general theoretical position on capitalist crisis and then move into my specific analysis of the current crisis. In general, when we talk about capitalist crisis, we have to come up with some answer to the question of what is it that causes recession and inflation. And I think that can be said essentially in one word, of course, with some development. And that word is overproduction. And here's essentially how it works. Capitalists, in order to maintain their position as capitalists, must get profits and must use their profits to expand their production in order not to be taken over by other capitalists. Capitalists get profits from production workers by paying them less money than the amount of value that they create through their production. They, in essence, work, they meaning the workers, work part of the day for themselves and part of the day for capitalists. And this situation is inherent in the capitalist system itself. As long as there's private ownership of the means of production, labor is purchased by the capitalists as a commodity at a price that's equal to the cost of maintaining and reproducing labor. Now, I want to elaborate on that just a bit. Marxists call this cost or this price of, of the commodity labor the means of, exist, of, of subsistence. And subsistence involves a whole variety of things. It not only involves the ability to get food and clothing and shelter, but it also involves the, the sort of psychological ability to get along in the society. That means certain luxuries. It means particularly for workers that have to drive to work having a car. It means education. And so that the point is that what labor is paid will vary from one country to another, will vary from one part of the country to another. And, but, but the point is that capitalists will only pay the minimum that they can get away with and keeping the rest for themselves and taking those profits and expanding their own production to keep from getting overrun by other capitalists. But in this lies a basic contradiction. Capitalists are motivated by the very system of which they're a part to keep production high and to keep wages low. And what this does is it causes the system to produce more than can be bought because there reaches a point when all the stuff the capitalists are putting out and paying workers low wages that they simply can't buy the products that are produced. And when this happens, essentially, we have a recession and sometimes a depression. Inflation can be looked at in a couple of ways. Uh, <clears throat> some producing sectors of the economy, for example, the automobile industry, must buy materials from other sectors of the economy, like steel. And if autos are being produced faster than steel, then an imbalance develops and steel producers raise their prices to ration their production. Okay, so the one aspect of inflation then are imbalances in the economy itself. When we have a non-planned, essentially anarchic type of production, that means that, um, that imbalances can very easily develop and that can be a cause of inflation. Um, a second aspect of inflation is the capitalists and the government which they control attempt to prevent declines in profit by injecting purchasing power into the economy by use of credit, uh, printing money, things like that, while at the same time rising, raising prices. Uh, it should be understood that this isn't a, a kind of conspiracy theory of capitalism. It's the logic of the system itself. When there's not enough purchasing power to buy the products, uh, there's a tendency for the system to respond to protect itself by injecting more purchasing power into the economy and that essentially becomes inflationary. So I think we can say that both recession and inflation are caused by one and the same thing and that's the tendency of capital to overproduce. Now that's just a very brief uh, theoretical view about capitalist crisis. Let me get into uh, a view of the current crisis, the crisis that we face right now. 
It's a complicated subject, and I'm not going to cover it in depth. The more things, I'm sure, can come out in questions. But let me try to deal with it briefly. With the maturity of our capitalist economy, several important contradictory tendencies have developed. Namely, weapons that are used to counteract capitalist crisis have, in my judgment, produced a greater vulnerability to crisis when it occurs. And that's a contradiction, that we have certain weapons uh, an arsenal of tools and so forth that are used by the bourgeois state and by the capitalists to combat crisis, which makes the system more vulnerable to crisis. I think there are four such weapons that I focus on. One is imperialism. One of the ways that capitalism has dealt with economic crisis is to export uh, capital to other countries. That, they do that in order to provide ready markets, to get cheap labor, to get cheap raw materials, and that helps absorb a lot of the surplus production. A second is Keynesian economic policy. That since World War II, one of the things that's been done, and particularly you know, beginning in the Kennedy-Johnson years, as I'll get into in a moment, uh, that the government has the ability and has used the tool to continuously stimulate the, the system by increasing government spending and lowering taxes when they want a stimulative policy, or by doing just the opposite when they want to cool things off. And I think that this particular weapon is another thing that creates this, this tendency to make us more vulnerable. And I'm going to explain why these make us more vulnerable in just a bit, but I just want to lay out the things. Um, thirdly, I think a widespread use of credit, um, both on the part of government as well as in the private economy, uh, has been another thing that's made us much more vulnerable to crisis. There's been a hell of a lot of interjection of credit into the system, you know, a great increase in, in debt of various sorts over the years. And finally, <clears throat> greater central bank activity, meaning that through the Federal Reserve System, we have the ability to alter the supply of money, affect the interest rate, and in essence affect the amount of money people can lay their hands on through central bank activity. Okay, so these are four things that I see as weapons that have been used to counteract capitalist crisis. The question is, why do I say that this is a contradiction? Why has this made the system more vulnerable? Several things here. First of all, generally, with increased productive capacity of large monopolies in a mature capitalist economy, such as our own, the tendency for overproduction and imbalances has become greater over time. I think that has its own logic within it, that when you have fewer corporations, but very large corporations, that when they overproduce, they overproduce with a vengeance. And um, you know, I think that's fairly self-evident. A second thing is that our reliance on foreign markets in, in this age of imperialism that we live in, when that's combined with the wave of liberation struggles in third world countries that have been going on, plus our inability to engage in direct aggressive intervention on the heels of the Indochina War makes our foreign markets unreliable. I want to temper that comment a bit. I do think it's true that there's a tremendous hesitancy on the part of government to uh, engage in any direct military intervention and that there's a lot of freaking out going on in Washington about you know, what's going on in the Middle East and what's going on in Indochina and what's going on in a lot of places for that matter. Uh, I do th don't think it follows necessarily that we won't intervene militarily. You know, it seems to me that one of the things that's happening is that there's a desperate search for a way out going on in Washington right now. And one of the things people should look at very carefully is the possibility that the um, deployment of the USS Enterprise and six warships to uh, the coast of Vietnam on the heels of a PRG victory in Indochina uh, could be a trial balloon to see how public opinion is going to react to a possibly new intervention. It also could be a prelude to uh, using that threat of, of the, quote, need for military intervention to uh, uh, make, make a wedge with Congress to uh, have them pass massive foreign aid for the two regime. I say that as an aside, but I still think that the basic point holds, that we do have a tremendous reliance on foreign markets, and we are in a very vulnerable position there. Um, the third thing has to do with uh, Keynesian economic fiscal policy. The decision to utilize Keynesian economic fiscal policy in conjunction with a generally expansionary monetary policy 
and a general expansion of credit caused during the Kennedy-Johnson years a lengthy period of prosperity. But that this prosperity was produced essentially with artificial sweeteners. The contradictions that I've talked about were still there. And I think what Keynesian economists tended to overlook was that recessions and depression even serve a very important function for capitalists. That is, that, that these economic crises serve the function of depressing debt and price structure and wiping out inefficient enterprises, allowing the system to periodically purge itself of its own poisons. And this has been a major function of, of capitalist crisis. So that when we've used Keynesian fiscal policy to, and monetary policy, central bank activity, to continuously stimulate the economy, as we've done over a period of years, the, the system has put itself in a very vulnerable position, made it much more vulnerable to more severe crises. OK, with that general view of the nature of the crisis now, having said that we have these economic weapons, but they, they've made us more vulnerable, let me now turn to looking briefly at the series of events that gave rise to the current crisis. Kennedy and Johnson administrations found themselves with a stagnant economy, with trouble at home with a militant black movement, and trouble abroad in Indochina. The strategy to deal with this was to simultaneously maintain or attempt to maintain a consumer economy, a welfare state economy, and a wartime economy. So we engaged in expansionist economic policy, that is deficit spending, easy money, easy credit, made the economy boom and people buy. At the same time, we engaged in a rash of new social welfare programs, and at the same time, we went to war. And this produced a number of problems, reflecting the underlying contradictions of the system that I've talked about. That is, as employment boomed, prices rose for greater profits. But the trouble was that in a period of prosperity, labor found itself in a relatively strong position and began to make demands on the system that actually threatened profits. And that when they did this, this caused greater price increases to be uh, invoked by capitalists. Secondly, certain sectors of industry were not able to produce as fast as others. And shortages in producers' goods and raw materials, as well as shortages in labor, caused even further price increases. <clears throat> Thirdly, increased production caused greater demand for imports, while high prices of U.S. goods caused decreased demand for our exports, and thus causing a trade imbalance to occur. So with greater sales and lower profits, U.S. firms began borrowing excessively and found themselves with a dearth of liquid assets, another problem. They couldn't put their hands on money. The Indochina War actually forced us to continue a policy of economic expansion, even though economic advisors at that time thought it was advisable to cool things down. Well, what happened was then that the balance of trade deficit grew, and this in turn, this is somewhat of an oversimplification, but this in turn uh, partially caused a deficit in our balance of payments, which in turn caused people to lose faith in the dollar. And there was a run on the dollar abroad, as you all know. And at this point, Nixon responded, after a number of other efforts failed uh, to try to stop the run. He responded eventually by devaluing the dollar, by encouraging food exports to such an extent that it drove up domestic food prices. And if all this was not enough, we had the major oil monopolies trying to cash in on the general situation of increased prosperity, and they created a fuel shortage. And this drove up prices of fuel. And in response to this, then, major international oil producers took advantage of that situation to protect themselves politically, essentially from US imperialism, by pushing up their own prices, and then created a real fuel crisis. Well, Nixon, for his part, uh, began to try to respond to all this between about 1969 and 1971 with his new economic program, a program that was designed, essentially, to cool off the economy by a forced recession, increasing taxes faster than government spending, and the invoking of wage controls. He said price, uh, price controls, too, but it was really more wage controls. But in true Nixonian fashion, he stopped short with an election coming up and proceeded on an expansionary course, which boosted profits 
and cause more inflation. What this did, essentially, was to glut the market with more American goods, and corporations found themselves in an extremely bad position by 1973. Investors were shifting from stocks to bonds, uh, forcing corporations to uh, assume higher costs for borrowing, you know, thus, thus aggravating their own problem with their liquid assets. Um, this caused them to raise prices, incidentally. Uh, that, in turn, caused them to find themselves with a lot of high-priced products in a glutted market, and hence declining profits. They responded, of course, with layoffs. And that's the particular situation that we find ourselves in today, unemployment and inflation. And it's up to Ford and the Congress to decide, essentially, whether to go for a depression or for inflation. And they're now all uh, scurrying about, uh, attempting to keep the wrath of the people off their backs by various and sundry economic plans that are essentially expansionary in nature. All of them talk about tax cuts. They're all variations on the theme. All of them talk about tax increases on fuels. But it's an essentially expansionary policy that, if it works, you know, will blunt the amount of, um, of recession that we have, but it will clearly be at the expense of inflation. Uh, and so from the appearance of things, I think that there is going to be a major effort to try to prop up the economy a while longer you know, through another expansionary policy. And of course, uh, uh, this is because of the seriousness of the crisis. No one wants to be you know, another Hoover or something. Um, given the complexity of the situation and our contradictory dependence on and weak position in the international economy, it seems to me this could turn out to be one hell of a crisis you know, when it eventually occurs. Well, this leads me to the second part of my talk. Given all of this, isn't it true, then, that capitalism will fall of its own accord? My answer to that, essentially, is no. <coughs> Marx, of course, said in Capital that capitalism has within it the seeds of its own destruction. And the contradiction I've discussed tonight is one of those seeds. But the primary contradiction of the system is the fact that private ownership of production creates these distortions in the form of crises, which cause a tremendous amount of suffering in masses of workers. Workers, for their, for their part, are producing through cooperation with one another, you know, on the line, to produce only to be exploited so that a heightened class consciousness on the part of workers will have a tendency to lead working people to attempt to socialize the means of production, just as they are socialized you know, on the line. Um, but Marx didn't mean by this, it seems to me, that this particular step of attempting to socialize the means of production would come about because of crisis. It seems to me that to the contrary, so long as capitalists can weather economic crisis politically, the crisis itself gives them a new lease on life. And the reason I say that is, is because of what I said about the function of capitalist crisis, its function of depressing the debt and price structure and weeding out inefficient enterprises, that, that this is a purge of the system. And so long as capitalists can weather a crisis, they come out in a stronger position generally afterwards. Um, I think another thing about this, and another reason why uh, such crisis doesn't automatically bring things about, is that more and more of the structure of the economy is shifting to the service sector, where workers are not socialized at the point of production in classic Marxist sense, that we have a lot of people who are hospital workers, who are workers in various social, ser social service industries, you know, who are not strictly production workers. And we can get back to that a little bit more in questions, perhaps. Well, given my analysis of the current crisis, I think we have to ask ourselves, is there anything in all of this that will cause people to automatically turn to socialism? Uh, the analysis of the crisis that I've presented, it seems to me, clearly shows that producing for profit rather than people's needs, a necessity under private ownership, necessarily distorts resource allocation by raising prices when it's clearly destructive to the masses of people to do so, by excessive borrowing for greater productivity when people don't need greater productivity, and by blatant militarism to protect markets needed you know, due to overproduction. 
But to the average worker, the reality of all this is a lower standard of living, and what she or he looks to is a way to recoup individual losses. So that even in the worst of crises, the people who suffer the most will reach for anything that offers a brighter alternative. And in short, unless there's a high degree of class consciousness before a crisis, there's no reason in my judgment to expect people to turn to socialism unless socialists have been presenting alternatives right along that address themselves to people's needs. There are actually numerous historical examples of capitalists weathering politically the most severe of crises. Post-World War I, Germany is one. The U.S. Depression in the 1930s is another. And the Student Worker Rebellion in 1968 in France is yet a third. And when we think about this particular crisis that we're going into right at the present time, although it looks very bad, you know, based on this particular analysis, I would argue that there's no reason to believe that this can't be weathered politically too, and that there can be actually more props uh, put into the system, you know, to, to eventually come out of it. And if all else fails, they always have fascism. <clears throat> well, this leads me to yet another point concerning the ability of capitalism to weather crises. And that is the question of what is it then that holds the system together and allows capitalism to weather these crises? Why isn't there a greater degree of class consciousness? And in answering this, I'd like to address myself primarily to the United States, the situation here in the United States. I would contend, first of all, that in the absence of a unified working class, it becomes possible for capitalists to buy time during crisis. And they do this by playing up divisions in the working class, giving privileges to some at the expense of others. And to the extent that workers accept a privileged position at the expense of other workers, there is no way the working class as a whole will be able to achieve a takeover of the means of production and a seizure of state power. The event simply won't come off. Furthermore, the process of revolution must deal with the cultural roots of these divisions. For if it does not, even in the unlikely event that power is seized by the working class, there will not, in my judgment, be a basis for a truly socialist state. What are these divisions, then, that I'm talking about? I'm going to talk about two, that based on race and that based on sex. The racial division is a very key one. And I would argue that a major source for a divided working class is essentially a, priv a system of privilege based on white skin color, maintained by the ideology of white chauvinism, or what we often refer to as racism. Historically, capitalism in this country developed out of a system of white privilege, and the ideology of white chauvinism grew out of that. If we go back and look at this historically, in the 1600s, many laborers in the South on the plantation were held in involuntary servitude, and they were both black and white, and they were not slaves for life. These people intermarried, they worked together, and eventually they began to rebel together. And when they began to rebel together, at the same time, uh, the plantation owners, the major capitalists in the South, uh, began to run short of labor and a real class struggle developed between planters and servants. And what was done to stem that particular crisis was to begin a system of white skin privileges. That is, more blacks were brought to the colonies, but this time they were brought as slaves, slaves for life. But whites, too, continued to be imported uh, from abroad. And they were imported in involuntary servitude, but clearly distinct from slaves. And not only did these whites uh, work on the plantations, but they were also given the task of keeping blacks in line. And following from this, other privileges in terms of type of work, education, and things like that were extended to white servants. Such privileges and the white chauvinism to support it has, in my judgment, become a very key feature in U.S. labor struggles. And what we have today contains some of the following features that are well known to most of us. 
That is job structures in which whites get the easiest and the highest paying jobs. Many unions that either overtly discriminate against blacks or and other third world people, or through restrictive membership, or more often by failing to push management on discrimination. Uh, they, they, in essence, push a system of white privilege. Or through the use of a seniority system to make blacks and other non-whites the last hired and thus the first fired. Thirdly, great disparities that are well known in education, housing, health services, and income between whites and third world peoples. Fourthly, a welfare system which weighs heavily on non-whites, serving a system of white skin privileges and fanning the flames of racism at the same time. A system which uses so-called benefits to keep people, largely non-white people, either out of the labor force when that is convenient for capital or in marginal low paying jobs when that is what is needed. At the same time, since working people pay for welfare through their taxes, and anti-welfare sentiment is easily maintained, which feeds racism. In short, by giving whites privileges and protecting and by promoting white chauvinism to justify these privileges, the capitalist class drives a wedge between workers, which has effectively diminished the potential of revolutionary working class activity. A second key division in the working class is between men and women. <clears throat> in many ways, this contradiction is similar to the race, racial one. That is, that capitalism has constructed a system of male privilege and justified it with the ideology of male chauvinism or sexism. The historical development of male privilege has also been extremely crucial to the development of capitalism. That is, with the advent of capitalism, a division was created essentially a division between the home and the workplace, which came to typify the, the private and the public, respectively. Social importance was given to the public realm, to the workplace, because it was here that money was ostensibly earned. And that as males became dominant in the workplace or in the public realm, by fighting for the rights of women workers in the workplace, in the home, as well as in the community in such areas as health care. <coughs> the importance of the class basis of women's oppression was highlighted by the subversion of an essentially working class movement by bourgeois women who pushed the movement into the confines of a struggle for suffrage, a struggle to which male capitalists eventually submitted taking the broader working class movement out of the picture. And let me explain what I mean by that a bit. It seems to me that it was clearly in the class interests of non-working class women to push on a single issue thing, on the, on the issue of suffrage. And it was clearly in the interests of, of bourgeois males to submit to that in order not to have to deal you know, with the more heavy implications of the broader women's movement that was going on at that time. It was fighting for women's rights as workers and merging the struggles in the home and the struggles in the workplace. That was threatening to the system. And, and in this sense, then, the suffrage movement essentially liquidated the uh, working class women's movement. Well, what did this prove, then? What is the role of women's oppression in holding capitalism together? Women have been assigned essentially two roles. One is the reproduction of the labor force, the women's role in producing a family and keeping the male breadwinner happy and to do all this for free. Secondly, it is to participate as a marginal member of the labor force, if we're talking about working class women, who can be forced to work at low wages when their labor is needed and to go back to the home fires when it isn't. These roles are essential to capitalism. Historically, women have been moved in and out of the workplace depending on the demand for labor. All of this is part and parcel, it seems to me, 
of a system of male privilege. And again, in this case, we can cite some specific examples of the nature of that system of privilege. That is, that men tend to get the best and highest paying jobs in the workplace, that men in many instances are relieved of the many tiresome and unpaid work that goes on in the private realm, that technology in the realm of birth control, an extremely important realm, places the full burden on women, and that unions, many unions, are dominated by men and have historically not dealt with the male dominance in the workplace. All of this, it seems to me, has resulted then in dividing half of the working class from the other half and has, in relegating women to, to the home, isolated working class women from one another. Now, these are just a few way, uh, two of the ways in which working class is divided. There are other ways as well, but it seems to me that these are the most critical. The point of all this is that capitalist crisis does not resolve these particular divisions or contradictions. To the contrary, it may even heighten them, causing both males and whites generally to hold on to their privileges at a time when they're very vulnerable, thus enabling capitalists to weather even the most severe of crises. <clears throat> well, this leads me then into the third part of what I want to talk about. And that is, um, what are the implications of this for all of this for a socialist movement? I feel that a key task is to build a mass movement for socialism that is capable of unifying the working class and raising class consciousness. And such a movement must have certain elements. For one thing, I think it's essential initially to promote and support autonomous third world and women's groups so that the most oppressed sectors of the working class can come together in order to press demands which can undermine white and male privilege. I want to say in, in addition to this that the contribution of the women's movement and of third world movements in, as well have been extremely significant in this respect in making it more difficult you know, for capitalists you know, to lay down some of the things they have in the past, that there have been great gains made as a result essentially of the autonomous women's movement and an autonomous third world movement. And these movements must be further encouraged and I do not concur as other Marxists have suggested that such activity divides the working class. I think that's absurd because it seems to me that the thing that divides the working class is the system of privileges that males and white people have. And that's what's really essential to overcome. And that's why we need autonomous third world and women's movements. <clears throat> At the same time, I also think it's important that multinational and sexually mixed structures be formed and actions taken that can demonstrate the efficacy of a united working class. In the process, the divisiveness of privilege within the working class must be highlighted and whites and males must be pushed to give up their privileges both for immediate and long-term gains. Now it's important to stress what I mean by that. I do not mean by that that people who are organizing you know, should harass males and all males and all white people and ta talk to them about their privileges. But it seems to me that there's a real distinction in the way groups approach an organizing situation. One kind of group might go into a workplace organizing situation, for example and attempt to find an issue you know, such as speed up or something like that that everybody can agree is bad and that everybody can unite on. While other groups that are primarily concerned with the very deep divisions in the working class itself might seek out a kind of issue to organize around you know, where the, the, the unity is not so great. For instance, in one plant that I know of, uh, a company, uh, the corporation was attempting to buy off a strike by increasing wages in departments that were dominated by men at a higher rate than in departments that were dominated by women. And one particular organization was talking simply about uh, increased wages in general, and another was talking about the fact that the corporation was doing this and trying to buy off the strike. And I think it's in the latter instance that I would put my marbles, that I think it's extremely important in organizing work to pick out issues you know, where there are divisions and try to bring people together on them and demonstrate that it's in the interest of the class as a whole not to take that kind of crap from capitalists. 
Okay, thirdly, this is the third element that I'm talking about in a ma building a mass socialist movement. The, in the building of a mass socialist movement, that, that building should be based on getting working people to act on their own behalf and in a collective way. In short, be based on mass participation. While at the same time, conscious socialists must be continuously attempting to demonstrate the lessons of these struggles, why they are succeeding and why they are not. So in short, my third point here is essentially that it's important in waging a struggle that we gain mass participation, that working people begin you know, to, to assert themselves and to fight on their own behalf. The fourth element has to do with imperialism. It seems to me that it's essential to building a mass movement for socialism that U.S. imperialism must be exposed in terms of its impact on American workers and that this must be done again through struggles against militarism in favor of using those resources for human needs. And again, conscious socialists should draw out the lessons in terms of the benefits of international working class solidarity to the working class in the United States. A fifth element is that in all organizing efforts, it seems to me, we must begin to try to link the community uh, and the home with the workplace, pressing demands such as community-controlled child care and opposition to various kinds of price increases and linking the actions that we do at the workplace with the actions we do at the community. Actions that essentially demonstrate how vitally linked the home and the workplace essentially are and how this essentially artificial division created by the capitalist system itself is one of the elements that divides working class people. Finally, it seems to me that in the present economic crisis, we must orient our organizing efforts in a direction that will be meaningful to those who are hardest hit. And that means to me fighting price increases and layoffs, pushing for human services and public employment, and making sure that people get all the social benefits, such as unemployment compensation, that are available to them, an essentially defensive strategy, if you will. But while doing this, it's important, again, for conscious socialists to draw the lessons of why we must w wage these particular kinds of struggles and what socialism as an alternative has to offer. In essence, then, the third part of my talk suggests that the implications of the points developed about crisis, the fact that capitalism won't fall automatically, are that we must build for a long-range struggle that emphasizes the oppression of third world people and women, that invokes all sectors of the working class in struggle, or involves all sectors of the working class in struggle, that exposes and combats U.S. imperialism, and that links struggles in the workplace to the in the community uh, that links struggles in the workplace to struggles in the community and, and currently attempts to defend working people against the ravages of the present economic crisis. Well, I'd like to conclude by saying a few words about NAM. It seems to me, and I think this is an area where NAM people would agree in general, that putting together a movement such as I've talked about cannot be the result of an edict of a national organization, that it's absolutely crucial to struggle at the grassroots in a coherent and in a cohesive way, and to use the lessons from those struggles to build a mass working class movement for socialism. NAM is not such a mass organization. NAM is not a mass socialist organization. NAM is essentially an organization of organizers, which is attempting to build a base in workplaces and communities across the nation, and also to unify large segments of the left to aid in that process. Let me say a few words about what NAM is doing. And I could divide this between work that's essentially national in scope, which many chapters are involved in, and work which is essentially local in scope. At the national level, NAM is involved essentially in three kinds of things. We're involved in anti-imperialist work. We're involved in what I would loosely call national issues work. And finally, we're involved in party building. I'd just like to elaborate on each of those a bit. As far as anti-imperialist work goes, one of the key areas in which NAM is currently struggling is in Indochina, with the Indochina War. 
uh, working closely with the Indochina Peace Campaign. Uh, NAM is currently gearing up for an Assembly to Save the Peace Agreement, which is sponsored you know, by a whole variety of organizations, including NAM, is being held in Washington on the 25th through the 27th of this month to commemorate the second anniversary of the signing of the peace treaty. And this conference is going to prove to be a major event. It's, it's putting forth the demand of all, uh, and of all aid to two. It's also making plans for further um, U.S. efforts to uh, stop the, uh, the, the U.S. involvement in Indochina. And in conjunction with that, many NAM chapters are currently uh, beginning to develop strategies for actions that will lead up to that particular thing, uh, essentially geared to pushing Congress very hard to end all aid to two. And I think that's a very important thing we could talk about in questions if people wish. A second thing in the area of anti-imperialist work has been NAM's involvement with the Puerto Rican Socialist Party as a part of the Puerto Rican Solidarity Day Committee. NAM has had a significant involvement in that. NAM has also been involved in the support of the American Indian Movement, particularly around the trials in Minneapolis and other places, has been doing basic support work for the American Indian Movement. And finally, under what I would call anti-imperialist work, uh, NAM has been rather significantly involved in support work for the United Farm Workers. Um, as far as what I would call national issues work, uh, we, we're doing a variety of things. Um, one of the things that, w that is over now, obviously when I tell you what it is, was that NAM, as a national organization, engaged in significant support for the mine workers' struggle through the United Mine Workers. And strike support was a major program up until the time the strike was settled. Um, currently, NAM as an organization is launching a series of forums and teachings on the economy that are going to occur in many cities across the country between uh, the months of February and March. Um, and as a follow-up to that, in, at a very recent meeting in Pittsburgh, national leadership decided uh, to undertake two major kinds of projects that many local chapters will follow. Uh, one of them is offensives against utility rate hikes. Uh, so there'll be utility actions and many NAM cha chapters going on. And in conjunction with that, to set up what we would call economic counseling centers uh, to try to counsel people in areas of unemployment compensation, food stamps, and welfare, which we feel is going to be a significant thing to do in this current economic crisis. And then one last thing I want to mention is that the Women's Caucus of NAM has been involved in a very significant way in developing a socialist feminist conference which is going to be held this spring. And the exact time and place of that has not been determined yet, but it will be a, a major conference uh, involving uh, many socialist women and working class women throughout the country. Um, in the area of party building, uh, at the last convention of NAM, it was decided that, that a major thrust of the New American Movement would be to cooperate with other organizations that are interested in building a mass socialist party. Um, this means essentially establishing relationships with other left groups that, uh, that, that feel like we do about the need for a mass socialist movement and a party. Uh, the major kind of uh, grouping that we've been involved in is what's known as the Mass Party of the People, which is essentially Arthur Conoy, who many of you may know of, and his friends, and representatives of the Southern Christian Educational Fund. And most recently, uh, there's been some indication that, um, that CAP, the Congress of African Peoples, uh, who's led by Emu Baraka, uh, may be moving in the direction of that sort, although that's unclear at the present time. Uh, NAM is, is not a, exactly part of the mass party of the people. I mean, the mass party of the people is an idea, not a party. Uh, and we have some differences with the Mass Party people. But NAM has been uh, involved in a whole series of conferences and has been going to all the MPP meetings and participating in the process that they're trying to start. Um, just briefly, in terms of local work, local work that, that isn't national in scope is extremely varied. Um, in the area of workplace organizing, we have NAM people, NAM chapters that are involved uh, in organizing hospital workers, factory workers, taxi drivers, school teachers, and daycare workers. And the area of community organization, <coughs> um, activities have involved um, daycare, uh, community development issues like urban renewal, 
utility rate hikes, which I already mentioned, tenants' rights, uh, community health clinics, and other things as well. So that's just sort of a brief note on what NAM is doing. Just in conclusion, I'd like to say that organizationally, it seems to me that NAM uh, is entering a period where it is beginning to move from a loose coalition of local organizing activities to a much more cohesive uh, organization capable of promoting a sufficiently coherent local practice that we can help build a movement for socialism, both on, a, on the lessons of that practice and on the roots which we are establishing in our communities and in our workplaces. Thank you. If I get tired, I'll just say something. All right, we'll have a question and answer period, and do you want to field the question? Okay. Yep. And um, when the question and answer period is over, for those of you who are still interested um, in discussing with David, there's going to be, for those interested, we're meeting at um, Jim Newcomer's house afterwards. So if you want to stay, and we can hopefully arrange a ride for you if you don't have a car, and we'll tell you where it is. And there's also a literature table in the back, um, and he, David's brought some literature from NAM, pamphlets and stuff. I don't know exactly what they are for sale in the back if you'd like some. It's open for questions now. It's always hard for somebody to be first. There's a brave person. Go ahead. Uh, you, you mentioned that uh, included in the subsistence wage for labor were certain luxuries. Now, I've never been able to get that out of Mars. I wonder where you got that. I didn't mean luxuries in the sense of, you know, Cadillacs and diamond rings yeah. and stuff like that. Okay. I, I just meant that, you know, I think it's essential, for instance, you know, for many people to have things like television sets. You know, which you could or could not consider a luxury. Yeah, I mean, it's it's essential to have a lot of things that um, that the people define as part of their means of subsistence. Okay, and you know, and I th I think Marx Marx did did indicate that the means of subsistence was mm -hmm. you know wasn't necessarily a, a just you know absolutely minimal you know life and death kind of situation, and it would vary you know w with cultural circumstances and so forth. And, and, and obviously vary with the strength of the working class and their, their degree of unity. Yes, sir. You spoke of uh, uh, opposition to imperialism, uh, but primarily uh, for the sake of the people of the United States. And uh, yeah, I'm uh, there have been periods when socialism uh, meant also uh, interest in the people of the world as a whole and opposition to imperialism for that reason. Did everybody get the question? I mean, it was, it was partly a comment, which I'd like to respond to. Did everybody get it? Okay. Uh, I, I think you're quite right. And I, I think that was a wrong emphasis in my speech. I accept the criticism. You know, it, it does seem to me, I mean, I was, I was talking there, you know, in the realm of, you know, what is the Laos capital to weather crises, okay? And, you know, in opposing imperialism, there are, there is the reason for imposing, opposing imperialism that, that, that it seems to me that what is absolutely essential is an international working class movement, an international socialist revolution, and that, that third world struggle should be supported in their own right not just because they'll help people in the United States. I agree with that. I also think that's an area where NAM has been weak, frankly. That NAM as an organization has not uh, been uh, involved in that sense uh, as, as much as they should. And that's, that's under discussion now. Yeah. Uh, could you elaborate a little more on how you sort of are getting things together? Like how do local chapters form? A bunch of people just walk around and say, hey, I like that name. How many chapters have you got? What's the growth pattern? Uh, what kind of struggles? Okay. Does it entail? Does it What's NAM all about structurally, right? Uh, okay. Democratic socialism, right? Or what are we doing? Yeah, that's a big debate right now. Uh, 
I don't want to, well, I, I could get into democratic centralism if people want to, but just, just in answer to your question. You want to know where we're coming from? I mean, there's many people in names who are interested in national movements and whether to ally ourselves with them, you know, right. so Okay, I'll just give, I'll give a sort of structural answer first and then talk about some of the politics of that, okay? Um, NAM is a national organization. The way it works is that there, there is a leadership body called the National Interim Committee that, that our group of people, 13 in number, they're elected at large from the whole organization at an annual convention. And it's also at that convention where major uh, political directives of the organization are developed. Um, in addition to that, there's a regional structure. That the, the, the country's broken up into regions, and there are representatives from the region that meet twice between each convention. Uh, the, the National Interim Committee meets every six weeks. Um, and then th there's the chapter structure. And um, the way chapters are chartered, essentially, <clears throat> the, the only real hardcore requirements for being a member of NAM is basic agreement with our political perspective, which is back there on the table for people who are interested. Uh, plus payment of dues, obviously, we have to exist. Uh, and, and what happens is when people write in and want to become members of NAM, we try to do, if we have the money, is to send a traveler to talk to people and to make some kind of judgment about whether they should be a chapter and a recommendation is made to the National Interim Committee. Um, that's not always possible to do that. And so sometimes it's done in other ways. If, if there's a chapter nearby, which there very often has been, you know, then representatives from that chapter, if not a member of the NIC, will go and, and visit with that chapter. And if that's not possible, so we try to make an assessment from the national office. And, uh, and if, if we're not sure, then we wait until we can get in touch with chapters. We also have a, have a members at large system. I mean, it, it's, it's possible to be a member of NAM without being a member of a chapter. And the procedure is essentially the same as far as becoming a member at large. It's a, it's a fairly loose structure right now. And I, that's one of the criticisms that I have of the organization. But one of the things that I think is happening with NAM, and I, I just kind of made these remarks at the end that I think we're becoming a tighter, more coherent organization is that there's a lot of feeling in the organization that this loose structure has been inhibiting. I mean, it's inhibiting, for instance, for me to come here and not be able to speak for the organization, right? Because we, but, you know, I think that's both a strength and a weakness. I'll just to digress just a bit about that. Um, that I'm really opposed to having a kind of line on everything as an organization until there's a sufficient grounding in mass work to make that lining, line meaningful. That is, it really comes out of people and not out of some heads in Chicago, right? Um, on the other hand, you know, I think it's high time that we have enough uniformity in the kind of practice that we engage in that the national leadership is capable of summing up experiences and developing political positions on things. I think that's the direction that, that NAM is moving in. Um, beginning the 1st of February, uh, the national office is going to move from Minneapolis to Chicago. And I think that that's a significant shift in a lot of ways. And the major way that it's significant is that uh, in conjunction with that proposal to move the office of Chicago, we've created a new structure, which is a, a political administrative committee that meets every two weeks that's composed of myself and members of the national leadership. We are where we are in constant touch with chapters, are analyzing practice, and are going to the meetings of the NIC and telling them about what's going on in case they haven't heard, and forcing them, in essence, to come to grips with political questions. Um, the question of democratic centralism is a difficult one. I think NAM as an organization is clearly not a democratic centralist organization at this time. There are tendencies that it's moving in that direction. But we really don't have the basis to do so right now. And I don't think we will have the basis to do so until we develop a more coherent politics. And I think, but I think that's coming. Um, you know, I myself think that NAM should move in that direction. I think it's important to. And I think there's a lot of other people in NAM who do as well. Uh, does, that, does that help? Or do you want to elaborate? Well, do you have a chapter in Des Moines? No, we don't. We have one in Iowa City, which I used to belong to. <laughs> other questions? Yes.
I said some other Marxist. Yeah. Okay, like before, you mentioned like the 70s, and obviously that um, killed a lot of political conversation. Yeah. And so I wondered, well, my point about the suffrage movement was essentially that it was co-opted by bourgeois women and that the working class aspect of it, you know, got lost in the shuffle, okay? But that, that is not an argument against uh, autonomous women's movements. Uh, to the contrary, you know, I think what a lot of the people in NAM are particularly concerned about is developing what we, what we call socialist feminism. And, uh, you know, where, where we encourage and, and particularly through the women's caucus, is tremendous support being given you know, to autonomous women's movements. And, and there are women in NAM who are in both NAM and other, you know, strictly women's groups. But, but our emphasis is clearly directed toward working class women. And, you know, and that was the point I was making. The reference to other Marxists or to some other Marxists, you know, was that, that there, are, there are groups like the Revolutionary Union, for instance, that uh, tends to be in opposition you know, to autonomous women's groups and says that everybody, that, that it's essentially a working class struggle and therefore everybody should, uh, you know, should get into that, presumably get into RU. And, and not uh, you know, engage in what they consider to be divisive tactics of, of autonomous women. But see, my point was that, that so long as, as a male chauvinist ideology and a system of male privilege uh, persists, that it's crucial to have autonomous women's movements to press the kinds of demands that are going to end that. Does that answer? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I think that's really important right now because, you know, I, I think one of the things that, that should be understood is that, that the offensive of the PRG in Indochina uh, is, is really an effort to, to collapse the two regime and force a ceasefire. I mean, it's a strategic effort in that direction. And it's geared very um, closely to the growing resistance movement in Vietnamese cities. And, you know, I mean, I think everybody knows two is in bad shape, right? Uh, if two goes down the tubes, that, that, um, that, that, that's going to s force a ceasefire, and that's what the PRG wants. And one of the best ways to support the PRG, it seems to me, is to put a hell of a lot of pressure in Congress to end all aid to two, uh, because that will mean the collapse of the two regime, and it will be m very much in line with what the PRG wants. Yeah? Yes? I mean, there's a tendency, you know, not to label so much in NAM, but, I mean, I would say yes. It's, it's very, you know, I mean, there's a lot of interpretations of what it means, particularly to be a Leninist. And, uh, you know, I mean, does it mean to be a Leninist that you have to be a member of a secret organization at this particular point in not time? Most people in NAM would say no. Uh, people in Revolutionary Union or October League would say yes. But, you know, that's a matter of interpretation. But I would say yes. At the